So three random movie clips um, amongst many that have stayed with me over my life. So what might those three clips tell you about themes, ideas, imagery, life that are, that are, that are part of my imagination? We, we all have an imagination that informs our worldview and how we conduct ourselves and how we live our lives. So based on those three movie clips, what are ideas and themes that you think are with me all the time? It's, there's, no, there's probably not a wrong answer, but go ahead. Community. community. Okay, community is definitely one. Okay, what's another one? Sacrifice. Okay, what's another one? Sharing, loyalty, acceptance. What else? What? Yeah, selflessness, perseverance, relationships. Anything else? Endurance. Loyalty, community, yep. teamwork, purpose, yeah, so, so we, can, we'll, we can stop there, and, and they're all right, they're, they're all correct. They're images, ideas that represent who I want to be, how I want to live, at the same time, what I aspire towards, who I aspire to be. And, and so those things create my imagination for how I see myself and the world around me and how I live, engage, and they're never far from me. And this morning, as we look at one of my favorite paragraphs in the scripture, we're going to look at Paul's imagination. Remember, it's, that, it's the drawing the curtain, like in Wizard of Oz, when, you, when, they, when they pull and see who's behind the curtain. Behind the curtain in all of our lives is an imagination. It's what makes you optimistic or pessimistic, or as pessimists like to say, realistic. Um, it's, it's, it's however you see, there, there's a curtain, and behind that curtain in all of your lives is your imagination. Imaginations aren't just about fantasies, uh, fantasy worlds that don't exist. They, they are, your imagination is composed of images and ideas that are always lurking behind the surface. It's your imagination that informs your response how you make decisions, how you perceive opportunities, how you look at other people. And so this morning, as we look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 and 18, uh, we're going to get a glimpse into Paul's imagination. So let me pray, and uh, we'll, we'll look at this passage together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. We thank you for Paul's imagination which has given life to our imagination. Because our imaginations can be spiritual. Our imaginations can give us life or they can give us fear. They can give us dread or they can give us hope. They can deprive us of opportunity or they can multiply our opportunity. So this morning as we look at this passage, I pray in Jesus' name that you would be our pastor today, that you would 
watch over us, that you would shepherd us into the heart of Paul's imagination, that we might let our imaginations be informed and inspired by his imagination. That we might arise as a community, as a people, that endeavors to follow well, love well, and serve well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So is this carpet my boundaries? Like, don't go past the carpet. <laughs> okay. All right, so um, let's look at chapter 2, verses 14 to 18 together. And what I'm going to do this morning first is I'm going to read through it. And then we're going to unpack the passage of some of the things that, that I believe are informing Paul's imagination. And then I want to make um, six quick observations with you. Okay, do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain or toil in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the, sac upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. Okay, so one of the things that always troubles um, people who study Paul's letters is this question. He is a Jewish man, kind of ha has the equivalent of a PhD in Jewish theology. Uh, he probably had memorized, if not all of the Old Testament, uh, most of it. Uh, he was then a teacher, a professor. He had his own little school of followers that he would teach and influence. And this man, as he calls himself elsewhere, this Jew of Jews, this Pharisee of Pharisee, this rabbi of rabbis, uh, he now goes to the non-Jewish world and he teaches the non-Jewish world about Jesus. And the question becomes, how much of that non-Jewish world even understood his allusions to the Old Testament? And, and the question is really irrelevant for this reason. Because so many times, think about it, you say things that has meaning, but in your mind, behind those words is that imagination of you. Your thoughts, your ideas, your worldview, your relationships, it's all part of it. it. It doesn't, the fact that they don't know what's informing your imagination doesn't obscure the meaning of what you're sharing. But as we have time to learn a person and know a person, we get to explore that person and, and, and we learn more about him. And it's true with Paul that, that we get his letters, we receive his letters, and as we read them and read them more closely, we get to see what informs his imagination. And so let me highlight some things that reflects Paul's imagination in this passage. First is, uh, if you don't know that the Old Testament, uh, was translated originally it was in Hebrew and then because more and more Jewish people spoke Greek and not Hebrew just like in the United States most Jews living in the United States speak English not Hebrew uh, no English not Hebrew and therefore the Old Testament scriptures for most Jews they read it in English it's not the original language of the Old Testament but it's the language they read so it is in Paul's day most people read the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is called the Septuagint, and it stands for 70, because in that edition, there were 70 books of the Old Testament rather than the 65 that most of us have in our Bibles. And in Deuteronomy chapter 32, there's this verse that in the Greek sounds an awful lot like what Paul's writing here. And in chapter 32, it says that God's people have been unfaithful to him. They have not acted like his children. This is their sin. They are a perverse and deceitful generation. Does that sound like anything we just read this morning? Look at that passage again. 
Children of God without blemish, though you live in a crooked and perverse society. So, so Paul is taking this imagery out of Deuteronomy and he's flipping it inside out. No longer is God's people a wicked and perverse generation. They are now children. They are living as children and they're living in a wicked and perverse generation. So in Paul's mind, the Philippians are just the opposite of what his people were when they were wandering in the wilderness. Secondly, there's an allusion to Daniel. Daniel, who's willing to sacrifice his life for that one thing, that one faith. And in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, it says, but the wise will shine like the brightness of the heavenly expanse, or like the stars, and those bringing many to righteousness will be like stars forever and ever. And so Daniel's, Paul's looking at Philippians like a Daniel generation. Um, he's taking that imagery that's fueling his imagination that he would have been raised on, thought about, held up as examples, and he's now letting that imagery inspire what he says to them. In addition, we, we ha we, we, Paul must have watched ESPN Roman edition. Uh, because he uses athletics a lot in his correspondence. And so in this one, he, he talks about that I did not run the race in vain. Okay? It's clearly, he's thinking of stadiums and runners and Olympics, and, and he doesn't want to be that runner who's done all this training and yet failed to cross the finish line. Or again, uh, he, he's a hard worker, and so he says that I did not toil in vain. This is a reference to people who worked with cloth, weavers, or Paul's a tent maker. And the imagery here is, is that you've worked with this piece of cloth, you've sewed, you've sewed it, you've woven it together, and at the end, you do something to screw up, or you have an imperfect piece of, of, of yarn or thread that then blemishes the entire piece of cloth, and now you can't sell it. So imagine... Paul's working, or he's watching the weavers working, and he's constructing his tent, and at the last minute, he realizes that he's sewn together a good-looking cloth with a blemished or stained cloth. It means that his labor for that time has been in vain. He's thinking about his work, working with his hands, his time, his toil. And then finally, there's this temple metaphor. He says that I'm being poured out as a drink offering along with your sacrifice. And so the imagery here is, is that whether it was in a Greek or Roman temple or whether it was the practices in, in the temple in Jerusalem, there would be this offering of, of water or wine that would be poured out alongside of the sacrifice that was being offered. This was as true in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem as it was in the Greek and Roman temples. And so again, we, he, there's this imagery that's, that's active because, you know, you just don't sit at the table and drum your fingers and go, you know, I, 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 I wonder if there's like a sports analogy I can come up with here. Uh, I, I don't know anything about it, but, you know, maybe I can read some books or things on sports and then come up. These are, this is part of his imagination. It's, it's things that are welling at the surface. They're, they're ideas, they're images. And so whether it's the temple or it's the marketplace or it's the stadium or whether it's the imagery of the writings and stories and narratives that he was raised on and taught on, these, these are all things that are always bubbling around and churning at the surface. That's why on my voicemail, uh, How You Reach Mark, uh, what's your favorite movie? What a person's favorite movie is tells me a lot about that person. If they say, gosh, that's a hard one. I have so many. That tells me they love movies. Okay. Okay. Uh, if they say, I have so many, but here's one, then, then it tells me when I call them back that maybe their life circumstance is such that it corresponds to the movie that bubbled up that they identified. Because our imaginations tell us a lot.
And Paul's imagination is fueling this passage. Can you see it? It's just bubbling to the top. Old Testament imagery, sports analogies, temple analogies. Heroic people like Daniel. These are all densely populating this paragraph. And so hear it again as we read it. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may be blameless and pure or innocent, children of God, without blemish, though you live in a crooked and perverse society, in which you shine as lights in the world by holding firm or onto or holding forth the word of life, so that on that day of Christ, I will have a reason to boast that I did not run in vain nor labor in vain, but even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice together with all of you. And in the same way, you also should be glad and rejoice together with me. So I've just identified for you some movie clips that are running in Paul's mind. And so I'll ask you the same thing about Paul that I asked you about me. Based on that and these clips, what do you learn about Paul? What's important to him? This is no more harder than you scrutinizing me. What's important to him? Gratitude. Word of God. Faithfulness. Perseverance. Finish well. I'm sorry? Purity. What else? Working together, community, yes. Not wasting effort. I'm sorry? Being genuine. Authenticity. Supernatural truth. Staying, staying without corruption. Or, uh, what was the next one? Endurance. A couple more. Anyone else? Reflecting God in everything. Joy. Trust. So as, as, as we learn Paul's imagination and these things that, that come up, then, then you begin to say, what I've learned about his imagination, you can take that with you as you read his letters. It's all here. Th these themes, these ideas, these, th they, they come up in a myriad of ways across the letters that we have written by Paul. But in this paragraph, I want to suggest to you that, that we learn six things that we can take away, and if we ever question, we can come back to this passage based on what, what Paul is teaching us. These six things are our ethic, our identity, our nature, our mission, our incentive, and our inspiration. Uh, we're, we're just going to highlight them quickly this morning. Uh, I would probably arrange them in a different order, but this is the order that I see them uh, in this paragraph. And so, uh, first is our ethic. Our ethic is to be blameless, pure, gracious, and honest. Integrity, to be women and men of integrity, that, that we are called to a different way of living. 
Uh, our, our ethic is, is one of grace, not retribution. It's love and forgiveness, even in the face of injustice or, or being wronged. Our way of living, doing life, relating to other people is meant to be distinct. Uh, because this, this whole section that began in verse 27 of chapter 1 about walking in a manner worthy of Christ. And then we have that great hymn that, that declares and exclaims and extols that Jesus did not count his equality with God as something to grasp but emptied himself and took on the form of a servant. And in a sense, after that passage, Paul is basically saying, go and do likewise. So our ethic is unique and distinct. We'll come back to that later. Our identity, our identity is we're children of God. We, we are women and men that have been called children of God. We're not strangers to him. We're not merely friends. We've been brought into this relationship with God in which when he looks upon us, he looks upon us as his very children. That, that's our identity. That's who we are. One of the things with recovery programs uh, that's been made known like with AA, you introduce yourself and you say, hi, I'm Mark Slomka, I'm an alcoholic. I believe there's something far more powerful to declare. I'm, my name is Mark Slomka, I'm a child of God who has struggled with alcoholism. One's my identity, the other's my battle. Those, those two are very different things. Our, our identity is we're children of God. And therefore, as children of God, our ethics should look different. What we value, what we uphold, our discipline, our sense of sacrifice, it, that ethic is all related to our identity, which leads to our nature. He says, which you shine like stars in the universe. Nowhere in the Bible are you called a moon. I mean, we have had some spectacular moons the last few evenings. Have you seen how big that thing is as it, as it comes over the horizon and the amount of light? It's almost like dusk through the evening because the moon reflects so much light. But it's not in its nature. The moon is reflected light. It generates no light. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hid. Paul says here, uh, your light, you shine like stars in the universe. Our nature is light. That is why the world responds. I, I was thinking about this on the drive over, that our hypocrisy and the violent reaction it causes in others is because the world knows, sees instinctively that we carry this light, that we are light. And therefore, there's this recoiling, there's this reactivity that we would mix this light with darkness. That, that we would choose to, as people of light, to cloak that light with darkness that is foreign to our nature. So every time someone recoils at you and, and would accuse you as a hypocrite, don't, don't put that on them. It's probably because they're seeing that, that we've chosen pathways of darkness that are in conflict with the very nature that we've been given. Remember years ago, uh, 
a, a close friend who was like a brother to me. Is don't, as we moved around the country, his family was the only family that kind of paralleled us with our moves. And so we grew up together. During the summers, he would come and live with us. During the summers, I would go and live with him. And he was tragically killed uh, in, in a car accident uh, when he was 21. And when I was with his family, and we did the memorial service, and I played, and I sang during it, and then, but it was just like, I was, I was a mess. It, w it was the first time that I had lost a family member. And I felt like I had let God down because I had wept. And I, I mean, I just felt like I had failed everything. And I went back to his room and was sitting on his bed, and his family came back, and, and they said, where, where do you find your strength? I mean, it was like we were all in shadows of darkness and you were light. I didn't feel like light. But you cannot conceal your nature. You cannot conceal your nature. And there, there's something that provokes anger, reaction. When people seeing your nature expect a better way, a better conduct, more liberal expression of love and graciousness. They expected it before you ever said a word because in Christ it's your nature. And therefore all they got was the same anger that they get from everyone else around them or in the world around them. That's why the world gets so upset with us. They expected more it's our nature. Christ in us, Paul will say elsewhere, the hope of glory. How can that not change our nature? Our ethic, our identity, our nature, our mission. Uh, there's a lot of uh, variety in translating the phrase hold firm the word of life or hold fast the word of life or hold forth the word of life. Uh, it really all depends how you translate this on what you think the situation in Philippi is that followers of Jesus are dealing with there. If you think they're under siege, then it's hold fast, hold firm. But what it doesn't mean is isolate yourselves. L look again at the language in which you shine like lights in the world by holding on to the word of life. It's missional. This is where we get our mission. You can see it here. Paul's imagery of our mission. We are living in the world, shining like stars in the darkness, holding firm on what, how we live and who we offer. What we have is the word of life. So our mission isn't to get distracted and think that we can be more relevant, more insightful by giving people a different word, by holding forth a different alternative. We live holding firm and holding forth this word of life. And, and I wonder what was going on in Paul's mind when he wrote this, because this is the only place in all of his letters that he uses this phrase, word of life. But it's so evocative, isn't it? I mean, just the very phrase, it's life-giving. Holding firm to hold forth the word of life. That, that's who we are. That's what we're about. That's our mission. We shine like stars in the dead of night to hold forth, to give people the opportunity to receive and live their lives by this word of life, this life-giving word. It's our mission. Our incentive, 
is the return of Christ. Hold forth the word of life so on that day of Christ. There's a finish line. Jim, Jim talked about Paul wants to finish well. There, there, finishing well means that we have to have an incentive. There's a finish line. I, I just got to get across that line. At Christmas, Santa brought us a machine, fitness machine, uh, to work with because one of the members of the household was just putting on too many COVID pounds um, during the isolation. I mean, when, when your commute is upstairs or just down the hall uh, to your office, and in your office is a refrigerator um, and, and a little cupboard with snacks and things, it's, it's easy to put on your COVID-20 or 25 or whatever. So, so the, the first day I, I started using it, it was like, get to 15 minutes, get to 15 minutes, get to 15 minutes. You know, and then the next day, it's like, get to 17, get to 20, get to 20. And, and, and you keep pushing it because there's a finish line in my mind that I'm going for, and it represents an incentive. Paul's incentive, that finish line, is the return of Jesus. There's an end. My God, there's an end. And thank God there's an end. And it's going to be a great and glorious day. I don't understand other generations that seem to rub their hands together and lick their lips at, at the wrath of God being displayed. Uh, I, I'm more excited about the newness that's going to be revealed on that day. Revelation chapter 20, no more tears, no more crying, no more violence. We'll have no need of a sun to illuminate the day because Jesus Christ will be our illumination. I mean, it's so graphically wonderful, uh, the imagination on display through the revelation of God in that book. But I mean, that's incentive for me. That's incentive to live and relate and to persevere and endure and when necessary, take it. Because I want to live my life in, in alignment with that moment of newness. Rather than carrying around the injustices and the bitterness that accompany life in this world. Paul's incentive, the return of Christ, are inspiration, the lives of others. This whole thing about, I'm, a, I'm like a poured out sacrifice along with the sacrifice of faith that I see in you. And I rejoice in that. I rejoice in what I see in you. Please rejoice in what you see in me. Now, I don't know about you, I have no trouble saying the first but there's something in my imagination that sounds, well, you know, rejoice in what you see and moi. I mean, that's that, that sounds a little bit fat-headed to me. It sounds a little bit self-centered, narrow. So I have to confess, I'm not there, but I'm there in the first half. Our inspiration is the lives of others. That's why it's great to read historic Christian biographies. Be inspired by the lives of others. Read about those who gave their lives and be inspired by their perseverance and their focus. That's why I love the end of, of the Razuli clip. That's from the movie The Wind and the Lion. Uh, and and they, they've lost everything. But this whole idea, is there, is there one thing in life worth losing everything for? We draw inspiration from the lives and the examples of others. And sometimes that inspiration at first makes you feel worthless. Like every time I get a letter from Josh and Emma Quisenberry for Gems Foundation, and I read everything they're doing, I rejoice in what they're doing, and then at the same time I go, my life is useless compared to what they're doing. Or when I hear from Roma or, or go visit Father's house in Ukraine, I think, man, what they're doing here is incredible. What, what am I doing? 
I mean, it's so easy, but at the same time, you draw inspiration from that. You draw inspiration from their lives. Challenge can be an inspiration. It's, it's all there. In this dense paragraph that's pregnant with Paul's imagination, we can see our ethic, our identity, our nature, our mission, our incentive, our inspiration. It's all there, black and white, on display. I wrote this down last night and then I forgot to print it off. Um, that the celebration of community life and opportunity for new life does not change our circumstances in our contemporary world that's predisposed to reject Christ in his way. The resurrection of Christ and the life he promises is lost on the world in which we live. It's lost. Until it can be discovered and found through us. But we are promised that the world cannot quench our nature and, or rob us of our identity. Has no control over that unless you yield and surrender. Now, you and I can sometimes get frustrated with Paul. Why isn't he more specific? Why doesn't the man give us more rules? Why doesn't he just explicitly say, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this? Because again, in this passage, we, we see it on display. He creates frameworks because the Christian life isn't led by a rule book. It's a relationship. It's, it's a sense in which he says, in effect, this is the gospel, this is what God is like, this is what God has done for you, and this is what God expects you to be like. Work out what that means for yourselves as a community. That's why, again, he he says, walk in a manner worthy of Jesus, who did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself in the form of a servant. And on and on that song lyric goes. And he says, you don't need a rule book when you have Jesus. And listen, if the last 16 months have taught us anything, It's that our world, our city, our state, our nation needs a Jesus generation that is composed of generations and cultures that will live differently. Do not sink your star in the darkness of the world around us. For Paul says, you shine like stars in the universe, holding forth the word of life. I was watching Vince's message from last week and appreciated your transparency and what you were sharing. I'm just going to say this. Echoing everything Vince says, we take this passage seriously. It's not about who's not here. It's about who's not yet here. World of difference, folks. We surrender those who are not here to the Lord. And with that, as Vince said, we can express our sadness and grief that people that we love aren't here right now. Doesn't mean they're not coming back. But our focus, given who we are and what we have to offer, is on the people, the children, 
tweeners, the teens, university students, young adults, adults, old people who are not yet here or anywhere. Their lives have been disrupted. Relationships have been frayed. Jobs have been lost. Families broken. We are surrounded by millions of people in this county who need to experience the word of life. And therefore, we, as a community, have to hold firm to this word. Hold firm to this word of life. Live our true nature. And bring and include and connect I'm not saying that their first stop is, hi, I'm Mark, come to my church. It's like, hi, I'm Mark. Let's build a friendship. Let's build a relationship. Let's create influence-permitting relationships where we can be, live, and offer the word of life. I'm far more concerned about the people who are not yet. and need the life that only Christ can bring. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Vince said that he um, likes to think about a worship song that's attached to his message, and so I thought I'd one-up you. (laughs) Yeah, competition is one of my top strengths. So anyways, uh, this song has always accompanied my imagination uh, with this passage. 